<laughs> hey, uh, yeah, um, awesome to be here. I might just move that actually as I wander around the stage a little bit. Um, so, um, had a great time yesterday. I went into um, a church yesterday morning and um, shared uh, testimony and so with um, as a, at a men's breakfast. Uh, Sixty-eight people, I think, registered for the men's breakfast. So. Uh, had a had a really good time, and um, I might share a little bit more about that later on as uh, um, as, as uh, this during my sermon. But uh, I just like for Mark Mark Adams. Um, Mark had a had a healing um, last week. He was prayed for. So uh, Mark, come up, come on up and share. And uh, Mark won't mind me telling you he's hard of hearing. So we're praying for his hearing still. But uh, Mark, come on up, brother, and. Tell us what happened. Um, I know you want you might want to go back. Uh, you've got other healings you want to mention. So, yeah, thanks, brother. Mark Adams, everybody. Hi, guys. Um, <laughs> I know quite a lot of you, but yeah. Um, I was going to go back and say a bit, but um, I'm not going to because this healing that happened a couple of weeks ago, um, it, it was awesome. And but I've, I've been praying, and I've got people to be praying for me for my hearing because I'm very, very deaf. Um, and I struggle with that, and but I've got, had shingles as well, and this the shingles were right around there, and it was really painful, and it was continuously um, just that pain, and it was quite debilitating, and you just get down, you know, and um, you, you feel sick and hate it. But anyway, I came up, and I, well, my focus was the heal, heal, uh, healing of my ears, and so I came up, and... Um, I was over here, and and Lynn and uh, Jenny were praying for me. Um, Ian prayed for me, and but the thing is, I couldn't hear anything they were praying. <laughs> so, so, um, and, and I actually asked, um, I asked the guys to write down what they were saying because I couldn't hear it. And so, when I got the healing, it it instantly didn't happen. Like I didn't feel anything. I was probably focused on the healing of the years, and and I didn't feel anything there happen either. So, uh, and I wasn't disappointed. But the thing I'd encourage people here: that this is you know this is a family of faith. We care about each other, and sometimes when you're sitting there and you think, oh, should I go up for prayer, or maybe oh no, I've tried it before. No, so sometimes when you get that wee sort of encouraging that prompt. It's a good thing to go. So I actually felt that that day. Um, and I just went straight up the front, got pray- prayed for, didn't feel anything happen. But I got home and that night I actually was thinking, I haven't felt any pain all day. And so that was awesome. But I didn't want to tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound full of faith, but that's just, I'm telling you how I was thinking. And and so I, I left it and I'm... I'm Conscious of it's not painful, and I'm thinking, yeah, this is awesome. You know, the Lord's probably healed me here. So the next day, I waited the rest of the day, and then that, that evening, I told Gail, my wife, and Eden, and and um, you know, I was just absolutely blown away, and I, I was awesome. Now, why I'm not sharing back is because when I got here this morning, um, Lynn gave me what she had said, and could you read that out for me? Because I'm not. I did read it, and, and I'd probably start crying if I start reading that. No, I was and I shot. think this is relevant to all of us, what it said. But I really, I, I was touched when I read it. I just read it just before. Sunday, 9th of July, 2023. I saw a long train with lots of carriages. The carriages were full. You were down the back carriages. They were full with words and things spoken over you in in your lifetime. These things were not you. We broke the word curses spoken over your word, um, over you, and words spoken by parents and those in authority over you. God wants you to come up and sit in the high places. You've been sitting in the wrong carriage. It's time to sit where you're supposed to sit all along. Yeah, when I when I read that just a few minutes ago, I, I just it was just touched my heart that the the words that God speaks over us, that's it. 
we do get words spoken over us, and that can just motivate us to what we do. You know, sitting in there, not coming up, that sort of thing. It's not going to work. And, you know, but I was just, thank you very much. We've got an awesome family here praying, and awesome things are happening, and awesome things are going to happen. Definitely. Yeah, God's at work. A- Amen. Thanks, man. Thank you, brother. Thanks, man. It's just awesome. Cool. Um, thank you. And, um, let the Holy Spirit soak in a little bit here, eh? Because he's just, you've just been encouraged and God wants you to understand that, of what he's doing in you and and, in us together. So just, yeah, thank you, Lord. You know, I've, um, as we've been going through Acts and we've been going through Mark and so on, I found it astonishing, you know, that um, people could see healings happen and um, and not uh, um, not see God's power, not agree with with with, could not say that that's a miracle from God, even when it's in front of their own eyes. You know, Jesus said to Thomas, "You know, blessed are you, Thomas, because um, you've seen. Um, you know, what is it? Blessed are you, Thomas, because you've seen and believed." but more blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believe. And I took that to mean in some ways that if you see something, you will believe. I remember as a young person saying, God, if you make yourself manifest, I'll believe. But as we read the Gospels, that's not always true. People can choose not to see something, not to see that it's God. And I, and I, and, and I think, it's a, I think much, much of it comes down to an uncomfortable truth. So seeing's not always believing. And if, and if the power of the gospel becomes, becomes an uncomfortable truth, then God help us. You know, I mean, like, wow. I've shared the story before of a pastor. Where I can share it because he's not like this anymore. So I'm not saying it as a criticism. It's a part of his journey. But he was preaching and he was talking about, he was going through a book in the Bible and as he went through it, they came to healings and he preached on the healing and, and so at the end of it, a lady came up and said, I've got such and such, can you pray for me? And, uh, she, and he goes, oh, I suppose so. So he prayed for healing, not expecting anything. And then later in the car park, she comes running up to him. She said, I've got to talk to you, I've got to talk to you. He's thinking, she's saying... But, um, um, you know, I need you to pray again because nothing's happened. And he's like, no, 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 I've got to go, I've got to go, I've got to go, you know, that kind of stuff. And she said, no, I just need to tell you I'm healed. And his first reaction was, oh, great, now everybody will want that. <laughs> and it become an inconvenient truth. You know, that was it. And I can, like I say, I can say it because he's moved on. And he was the one that Ian prayed with later on. And, and like he said, uh, you know, when I was a young fellow, I felt the Holy Spirit. I don't now. And I haven't been able to work it out. I haven't been able to listen to that. And Ian said, will you give up your, your right to work God out before you obey? And then something went clunk. And he's a man who moves in the Spirit now. And learning to. We're all apprentices you know, with God, we're all his children, and we've never got it all worked out off pat, but man, when the gospel becomes an inconvenient truth, may it never become an inconvenient truth in this place, and so Mark and others who have been praying, and see, my mum, my, my brother went blind at 21, I think he was, or might have been 22 years old, completely blind, and and he lost his marriage, and, and uh, um, his, his wife left and took their child, and, and he was married very young, both of them, and, and um, you know, and, and he would say that was the wrong thing to do, you know, and look, well, if he was still alive, he'd say that was the wrong thing, you know, I'll just speak for him at the moment, sort of thing, but, but um, in it, my mother had a, um, she just went through a real strife, and, um, and I, I can remember her, have, I'd never heard of shingles, 
So I, just, I remember she was helping my father out in the paddock and a, a gust of wind blew up and she had all these sores around her legs and, and everything else. And I said to her, Mum, what was that? And she said she had them all over. And, and I, I don't know how she lived with them. Pastor friend of mine was at a church and he had um, prostate cancer. He went through the treatment. He had to go into hospital while he was in hospital. He got a superbug. So when he fought off the superbug, he got shingles. And out of all three, his shingles is the one he didn't want. Someone else, he left that church. Someone else went in there. They got shingles. And when it, I've seen the agony they go through. I'm celebrating that miracle that Mark just said he had shingles. And our God set him free. And he was being prayed for and couldn't even hear what they were praying. God is good. Amen. God is good. He is so good. Don't give up on a God of miracles, a God of signs and wonders and power of the gospel. If you preach his truth, and I don't mean me or Ian or whoever's here, I have everybody who here would preach truth at least their perception of the way we understand it. But I'm talking more as everybody, as individuals, as you share truth, we're going to see in the Scriptures as you, as you are bold and share truth, signs and wonders will follow because God wants to glorify His Son and He will do it. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He loves you. He loves every single one of us. And he longs to pour out. That, that, that scripture I just quoted then is in Luke. I think, it's, I think it's Luke 13. If it's not, it's Luke 17. I can't remember. But uh, um, it's been sort of a, a, um, a basis f- um, for, for us in this church, I believe, as, as uh, well, my senior leadership. And it was Jesus who said it. Fear not, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So we've got to imagine what the kingdom looks like. We've got to get out of our structured thinking. And like, well, if, if I was walking through here with Jesus, what would be happening? Like, wow. And he wants us to be bold like that and declare that. He loves us. He is for every single one of us. If you're here this morning, you know it because you wouldn't be here. He's a good, good God, and I'm way off track. <laughs> I listened to Ian preach last Sunday, and I wrote down, I just had this thing, if you don't believe who he is, and in his resurrection, then you probably won't see the miracles. If you're convinced of Christ and his resurrection, then you'll see miracles easily in everything and in everyone. I can see miracles in every single one of you. And I mean that from my heart. I say it before the Lord. I can see miracles in every single person when they come to the Lord. I can see miracles in creation. I love creation and I love the creation story. I shared at the men's breakfast about how I, um, when the night I got saved and went home and in the morning we had an early start. I was portable sawmilling and We had to beat the heat, and I think um, in the morning, because the fire risk went up so high in the forestry, and so I was up with the sparrows, and and, um, and I can remember thinking, I just got to get outside and talk to God, because I didn't think he'd hear me with the tin roof. I don't know why I thought he could hear me in here on that Sunday night, but on Monday morning, I had to get out of our garage we were living in, and I had to get outside because I just wanted to talk to God. And so I looked up to heaven where I thought God was so I could talk in a straight line and I saw the sky and I was completely blown away how I'd missed it for 27 years. I'd not seen it. Like, there's a miracle in everything. This carpet's a miracle because it came off sheep that were created by God. And I'm not trying to dumb the miracle thing down, but when we begin to see, like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the skills. Thank you for what you've, you've taught us. Thank you for what you, you've made us all individuals that we need one another. I can't make carpet. 
I could share the sheep, but not like a shearer. I struggle through. And there's a few bootlaces, we used to call them, you know, but anyway, um, (laughs) maybe I better not elaborate on that. (laughs) Bootlaces used to be made of leather ones. Skin. I just can't help myself sometimes. (laughs) Got to ask. Better do that. If I get into Scripture, God save me. Please, Lord Jesus. Acts 4, 23 uh, to 31. And we're, this is the story. See, Luke's, Luke's been giving us this accurate account. There's one thing about Luke um, who's writing Acts. He's, man, he researches. He goes into, you know, like um, when we're in the Gospels, Mark, there's a story, there's a healing. And all the Gospels, there's a healing that happens. It's, it's that long. This healing about the beggar at the gates, it's two chapters long. And, um, uh, you know, like, well, not that Luke was putting in chapters, of course. That all came a few hundred years ago. But, but um, so I've been listening to McCary College course. <laughs> but it, but, it, but um, he's, he's giving this long account. And so the stubbornness I was talking about before, the reluctance to see miracles and everything else, of course, with the Sanhedrin and, every, and everything else, and they've locked Peter, they, they got a hold of Peter and John, and they locked him up overnight, got him out in the morning, let him go, so I'm just going to pick him up from here, and, and hopefully I'm going to complete this chapter this morning. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people, and reported all that chief priests and the elders had said to them, and when they'd heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, um, our father David. Um, Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain and the kings of the earth rise up together and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one? Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. I just want to break that down a little bit. In the beginning, like here they are, the, um, you know, there's a lot to celebrate. They know what happened to Jesus when he was pulled in with the Sanhedrin and the council and the high priests and everything else. And quite possibly Peter and John thinks this will be it for us too. But they're released, you know, and and so they come back together, and what's the proper response? Well, it's praise and worship, and they got together. You know, it's, it's been, um, Luke has, has said, you know, that all the way through um, that the that, that church came together, they were very close-knit, so they all raised their voices together in prayer back in verse 24. When he says sovereign Lord, if you break that down in the Greek, and I'm going by, um, I didn't search it in the Greek, I'm going by what I read about it um, from F.F. Bruce and uh, John Stott, a couple of um, famous um, commentaries, uh, but in that they were saying uh, that the word used is like for a slave owner, and um, and so it, it's a... Uh, um, he, sovereign, you're, you're over all things, and and um, you know, we're, we're your servants. You made the heavens. They're lining everything up in their prayer. They they're lining up with scripture so they can pray straight, and so they it's almost like like washing your mind. God, you are sovereign. You're the one over us. You made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. It's a great place to start. I know in the church there's the evolution things you know and there's like a little bit of this and a little bit of that and everything else i was going to tell you where i stand i believe the bible from the first page to the last page and that's it with me i'm not an educated man i'm not a scientist i'm not a geologist i'm not all those other things but i do believe in the bible 
all the way through from, from, from the first page to the second page. Sorry, to the last page. <laughs> Say it again, I'm not an educated man. I'll get to that later. <laughs> but if you can't believe in that, then how can you believe in resurrection power? If you can't believe in resurrection power, what will you believe in? My trouble, my trouble was, is especially with, with evolution and in Scripture, Jesus quotes, he's like, as it was in the days of Noah. See, as it was in the beginning. As it, it just, he, he goes well back. Jesus mentions creation himself. As it was in the days of Jonah. If you don't believe creation, you're not going to believe Jonah. But they're all significant. You're not going to believe where, jo- where Joshua is fighting and he needs more time and God gets the sun to stand still in the sky. I believe all that. I don't have any reason to disbelieve it because everything lines up with me in Scripture. Everything, I don't believe there's the contradictions. There's the, you know, there's nothing major that changes anything. I love his word. If you don't love his word, start doing it now. And I mean that. Love is a verb. Love is a doing thing. Love is an action. So if you just like you're not naturally going to fall in love with your enemies, are you? You're not that's not a natural thing. If someone's at you persecuting you and everything else, that's not a natural thing. So but you're commanded to love your enemies. It's a doing thing. We've got to find a way to do it. Find a way to bless them. So it's the same thing. I just decide I'm going to love the word. And then if you put that in your heart first, it happens. And so fall in love with the word of God. He spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of servant David. Why do the nations rage? See, this is King David. And Jesus is in his line. And not everybody, see, a lot of scriptures about the Messiah were not always obvious until Jesus had been and fulfilled them. And then people go, man, that applied to, the, the, you know, there's a scripture that's quite obscure and it talks about the 30 pieces of silver and all that kind of stuff. And then, oh, that applied to Judas. It's all in retrospect when it happened. You could see where it connected. But even 200 years before Christ was born, it was considered that this is prophetic of the Messiah and that the nations and everyone will rage against him. He was in David's line and, and, and the rulers and everyone will band together. And so they say, indeed. So therefore it played out. Herod and Pontius Pilate. Herod really, like, if he's in charge of anything, he's in charge of the Jewish kingdom under Rome. And so almost like if I, he was king in that respect. Pontius Pilate, um, under the emperor, and represented all the Gentiles. So they, with the Gentiles, the people of Israel, the city, to conspire against your holy, holy um, whom you anointed, Jesus whom you anointed, your holy servant. They did what your power and, and will had decided beforehand should happen. So in this prayer, I want you to see it, they're not asking God to judge them. They're asking God to keep what's happened in your mind because they've threatened us that if we go out and proclaim boldly, they're going to deal to us. So we need you to be with us. Derek Prince puts it really well. You cannot judge outside of the church. God does that on his own accord. He does that sovereignly. Inside the church... God judges. And so in here, these people are opposing the church. There's still opportunity for them to be saved. There's still opportunity for them to repent and believe in the signs and wonders that they've seen, believe in the resurrection of Jesus. Peter put that to them beforehand, boldly, when when he spoke to them, repent. So they're holding out hope. 
and, I, and stretch out your head. So they, they're saying now they're going to carry on and they're going to preach boldly and they're going to declare and God, you do signs and wonders. And then it gives you the reason. Through the um, Stretch out your hand and, and hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. It glorifies Jesus. Signs and wonders glorify the name of Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they're meeting was shaken. And wow, did things change then. Holy Spirit, the place shakes. The full. We need to have ongoing infilling of, of the Spirit of God. God is, he is awesome. I'm just going to carry on to Acts, 40, um, Acts 4, 32 to 35. But just carrying on from there. All the believers we're in one heart and one mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was no needy persons among them. I like that. There was no, no one in need. No needy persons among them for from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them brought, them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Um, we've been having a bit of fun with these scriptures this morning where we were just sort of praying before the service, and um, um, Ananias and Sapphira is in the next chapter, and, and Therese is going to preach on that next week. And uh, and so, um, I don't want to talk too much about Ananias and Sapphira then, um, but what we, but it does all connect up because as I say, there's no chapters, and Luke's telling the story that goes all the way through. This the, he's recording the story, and, um, and but anyway, um, out of it all, what I wanted to say in this, like. Well, first of all, my reading for Kerry College, just in the first chapter, like I always knew I was going to learn something that I haven't read before while I've been studying. And um, and what is and I, I didn't realise the level of poverty, biblically speaking. You know, you, you you can perceptions are very powerful things. So you can watch things on TV and you can watch stuff and you can you can read. But what, you're, what, what you see can be very powerful. And so it depends on the way you're wired, I guess. And, and when I see things on TV, I see marketplaces and you see food and you see this and you see all those kinds of things, you know. And, and then you'll see the odd p poor person getting beaten or this, that or, or whatever it might be. Oh, they're all working in fields and, the, and, it's, and it's beautiful golden harvest because they, they don't want to show you, I, sp I suppose, and it, it's not that cinemagraphic or whatever to show just paddocks of dirt you know that have just been sown or the fallow over the winter and so you can you can have this sort of thing build up in your mind so the statistics were jolted me a little bit said that 90 percent of all people in biblical times lived at a real poverty level and generally in subsistence and so when you worked, you got to work, um, it, it might be just for the day. And whether you earned enough to, to eat for that day could really depended on who was employing you and the type of work you were doing. So you could work all day and not earn enough to eat. You, could, you may work and you've got enough for family or, or whatever it might be. 3% were very, very wealthy. So 90% are poor, very poor, in and out of subsistence, in and out of enough and not enough. 90%, nine adults out of 10 lived like that. And the other 7% in the middle, I can only imagine they had some money or they weren't too badly, you know, or whatever it might be. I probably grew up even within our culture, and that 7%, my, not everybody, when I was born 1960, most people were on a single income, but my mum worked as a teacher. She never gave up. 
and my father worked because they wanted to buy a farm. And so when I was eight, we moved from Belclutha up to Christchurch and we got a few acres there where we developed the pig farms. And now we've got three incomes. Most people are living off one. And so I was raised in that sort of thing. And there was always enough, but they were fierce savers because they had vision of getting more land or whatever it was. And so mum sewed all their clothes and, you know, I'm... That's fine until you, uh, until you get conscious of, <laughs> you know, Levi's are out there, you know, and um, and so, so, so the solution for a lot of people was to sell yourself into slavery. Now that sounds horrendous, but actually it was seen as a way, as even as Ian was saying this morning, that it was often seen as a way is not actually now I can supply for my family and I don't have to worry. It's my master's concern. All I have to do is turn up every day and work really, really hard. And out of that, um, the responsibility sometimes came on that owner, so to speak. And so it was a, a very natural part of culture. And then after seven years, um, there's, you're, you're set free often, um, depending on what your owner and what you would agree to got upon and what they believed, I guess, you know, won't be true for the Gentile owners, perhaps. And so if you've gone and signed up with one of them, well, so, so, um, but here they were. So say Luke was saying in chapter two that they all, they fellowship together. And here in chapter four, he's saying they're all in one mind and they're in one heart. And I can imagine the poverty here is quite different. See, this isn't whether you're doing well or not doing so well or whatever. Imagine there's a lot of poverty here. And so some of them that had filled sold them and they came in and bought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And that was one of the jokes. Never been in an elders' meeting where someone's come in and, you know, or whatever. Very unbiblical around here. And, and, um, but that's, that's not the thing. Actually, we're, I believe we're a very good church at giving. You know, overall, I'm talking in a general picture. I know of churches that, in the end, they don't, they don't, and so now they don't have pastors, and they don't. Joy and I, I got asked to go into to to this men's breakfast, and the theme was. The power of the gospel to change your life. So oh, we'll get Greg and uh, we'll ask him and he can come in and tell us that how he got saved and how he got healed and how he got delivered and the power to change, change your life. And um, I've always sort of seen that as, as a bit of a rescue mission for me as a, f- from the Lord what do you do when you don't have an education and everything else? What do you, what do, you do when you don't have an education? And, um, and there I am as a laborer and I've a, got a really bad back. See, God has perfect timing. He could have healed my back ages ago. I may never have got a bad back money, you know. God, but no, he let you go because it's what turned me. And it's, I was beginning to get desperate around life. Believe me, for me to come to church for the first time under my own free will, I was desperate. And God heals me, and I'm convinced God exists, and He's forgiven me. And then later on, six months on, I'm, I'm delivered. But that's not what happens for everybody, and yet God is at work in everybody's life. And this is what I... I've, I felt like I had a moment with the Lord on the way home. And what I should have said was, in some ways, because there's only time for the testimony, that's what they wanted and, you know, and so on. And what I should have said was, give something, God, give something to God to work with. And, if, and so f- for me, I, 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 can, I can remember you know, like, um, when I... I fell in love with Jesus, but I also fell in love with his people because simply because they love Jesus. 
And I thought, all of a sudden, I've got all these new friends because it's, we've got Jesus in common. So I wanted to find out about him and what made everybody tick. And I loved it. I, I, I just, Joy and I could not wait. Monday was the worst day of the week because it was so far away from next Sunday. And then the week progressively got better until Sunday arrived. And that is true. It was like that for years for Joy and I. So give God something to work with, you know, like I, but I would, and I'm not, this is, you're all here in church, so obviously it doesn't apply to you. But it's like, I couldn't understand when people didn't come. I'm like, what is it that's possibly better than worshiping Jesus? What, you know, worship is giving back the best of what God has given us. What can possibly be better than worshiping Jesus? And so I line myself up with God in that way. And then we read about tithing. And this isn't, a, this isn't a push on tithing. But we line ourselves up and straight away, there were ones who felt they needed to protect us. I oh, know that's Old Testament or so whatever. And Joy and I sort of came to the conclusion, you know what? I'd sooner get it wrong doing it than get it wrong not doing it. That, that was just a kind of a thing that I went with. And Joy, Joy was strong on it. She sort of pulled me in. But you see here in Scripture that actually what happened is that they, it was a natural thing when, because I thought the church needs it. God's going to do something with it. What could be possibly better than earning something that God's given me and then give it back to him. And he's only asking for a part of it. These guys come in and they sold a field and they, here's the lot. I've never done that. There's been times when God's asked me to stump up. There's been, I've been through hard years, hard years. Joe and I were in portable sawmilling and we're doing all kinds of, well I was, I dragged Joy through it and there was years where I didn't even earn twelve, fifteen thousand dollars at the end of it all, that's living on a couple of hundred, two fifty a week, it was shocking but there's been years when I've given through real estate close to 20k so there's been years when I've given more than I even earned years just not long beforehand it is the greatest privilege ever, I believe, um, to be able to give. But here's the thing. You're giving God something to work with, and that's all he asks. And go for the long game. Go, go for, God, what have you got for me? What is it? What is it that you want to do? And then he began to do it. There was a little bit of a theophostic moment, a lump. Um, I'll explain that, but, but here's the thing, hey, shall I do these scriptures? See, the gospel is good news for the poor. In Luke 4, 18 to 19, the spirit, this is Jesus quoting Isaiah, and he's, he's quoting it in a synagogue. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, to the 90%. This is good news. God is good news. Things are about to change. He sent me to proclaim, proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery for the sight of the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In Luke 6, verse 20, it's looking at his disciples. He said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Prosperity comes in many different ways. Joy and I were just sharing that as we're sitting there this morning. A little bit further on in the same chapter in Luke um, verse 38, Jesus explains that give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. That is what I mean by giving God something to work with. Just give him something to work with. And I'm not trying to, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm responsible 
must declare God's promises over you and to communicate God's promises over you. And I wish somebody had told us earlier, even though I think we, Joy and I were probably tithing within our first year, and we, honestly, it was the widow's might. But it gives God something to work with. I, um, in Acts, this is the very last, this is the very last chap, uh, verse in, in, in Acts verse 4. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wind up in a minute. Joseph, um, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means sons of encouragement, sold a field he owned and bought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So this is where Barnabas is introduced and really is, Barnabas becomes this, we, we find out he's this, well, you know, like they call him the son of encouragement. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine like if, if, encour- if encouragement had a, had a child and you were looking around the room, like who... I, I was at a church, the church I was at was actually St. Albans, and Paul Weatherland's a good friend of mine, and he's got a son there, and I can tell you now, like, his son is the spitting image. Paul, you know, like, he, he's, he's with it, you know, um, fancy shoes, fancy haircut, you know, that kind of stuff, you know. V- v- well, he's got hair to have a haircut, so I'm jealous, you know. <laughs> you know um, but I was saying about, like, his son, man, he is the spitting image, even from behind. I, I saw him, and I walked up to him. Same haircut, same ears, same, he's just a bit thicker set. And I was thinking, Paul, you put on weight. And I was walking up to, to say good day to Paul, you know, and um, turned around. It looked like, like, it, Paul's quite, he looks quite young for his years. He's older than me. He's, I think Paul's about 67, but he looks he looked quite young for his years. And I said, everybody's got to see you too as father and son. He says, no, they see us as brothers. And so, like, he's like, like spitting image. So you imagine, if you're looking for someone that resembles encouragement, who's the spitting image of encouragement? It's Barnabas. Like, wow, what a statement to say about somebody. He's the son of encouragement. And man, do they need encouragement. Persecution's coming. It's right on the front door. But they are praying and they're of one accord and they don't want anybody. Deuteronomy, this is not a new thing to share things. Back in Deuteronomy, I think it's chapter 15, the Lord says, um, don't let any poor be found among you. Like, look after each other. L- love is what motivates looking after each other. The motivation and the ingredient here is love. And so here's Barnabas, he's, he's introduced here and. And he's a son, and he represents an integrity. The, the Jews, the Jewish people, I don't want to stereotype them all because they're not all like this, but the ones that have decided in power and they've decided to persecute Jesus, they're really in deception. They've seen the miracles, the signs and wonders, but they're in deception. But they didn't pray judgment. They're outside the church. Next chapter, 5, verse 1, you're going to introduce Ananias and Sapphira, and deception inside the church gets dealt with very differently by the Holy Spirit. It's quite sobering. Outside the church, inside the church, two different realms. It's amazing what happens in the things that, that, that begin to shape and mold you. When you love Scripture, it begins to clear away things. And, and when things are being rattled outside your sphere or in your, in your sphere, you can remain unrattled. You can, you can, you can be... Um, you can have a peace in your heart when, when nobody else has a peace. I've, and God will dig out little lies and keep digging out little lies and revealing them to you 
and um, so that in it we can be stronger going through every situation. I was sharing at St. Albans and I shared about the man who stood up on the stage and had a word of knowledge, um, sorry, the man standing back there, you know, he's got the bad back, God's going to heal you standing right where you are. And, um, and I mentioned his name. Now, I've mentioned to you his name, but I just don't want to do it at the moment because I, I don't want people checking up on, sorry, it's to protect his dignity and he's passed away, okay? And uh, so he can't, he can't say, no, that wasn't right. But, but um, what I'd heard him is Morris went and visited the guy when he was dying and his marriage had actually broken up. And Morris visited him when he was dying. And um, he, bro- he burst into tears when he saw Morris. Morris was talking, Morris Atkinson, sorry, for those of you visiting, was our previous pastor here um, who's also passed away. And, um, and as he was talking to this, this I was going to call him a man of God. He said that he really struggled because he had this fear that he had no fruit from his ministry. And um, and uh, and I, uh, and anyway, so um, okay, so I share my testimony, and I share that this is the guy, and this man comes up later on. He goes, "I was an Elam pastor, and I knew him really well," and uh, and so we got talking, and I said to him, um, "So how well did you know him?" He said, "Well, he used to be a pastor for because um, I said I didn't realize he was an Elam pastor." He goes, "No, he wasn't." He was a pastor at another denomination. There was two of them, and they got filled with the Holy Spirit, so they got fired. And so they came to Elam. This is in Stoke. They went up, and, and out of that, he had an itinerant ministry. And I, he said, um, how many times did you see him, and what happened? with his? Did you know his wife? And I said, yeah, you know, she used to be married to a helicopter pilot and all that kind of stuff and that, was, that passed away also. And, and anyway... Um, and I said to him, um, I know when Morris saw him, he was worried he had no fruit. And the guy goes, he was always worried he had no fruit. And when he said that, something hit me. And I thought, that's what I believe about myself too. I've got no fruit. And, um, and, and so I, I, uh, I, said t- I, I didn't say that to this guy. And he goes, it's a lie from God because you can't manufacture fruit. It's only the Holy Spirit who can give you fruit. That's what I'm saying. Give God something to work with. And so God was showing me on the way home, Greg, you've given me stuff to work with all your life, and I've been at work in your life all your life, even before you knew me, even before you were healed, even before you looked up. I was at work in your life. Just keep giving me stuff to work with. So straight away, I I was like, God, I I don't know what I'm, I don't know. You know, like, um, how did it get in? And I came here last night, I'm sitting in the office, and this is about one o'clock this morning, and, and I, and I, and I, and I was like, Lord, I don't know where, I, I don't know where it come in, and, so I do the Thea Foster thing. Is it a familiar feeling? Yeah, it is. Where is it? You know, and, and um, so, Holy Spirit, could you show me? And he takes me to this place, and, um, and I'm 15, maybe I've just turned 16, and uh, here's my parents both being school teachers, but I'm rebellious as, and, and now it's come to opening up my letter for the school cert that my father made me sit and it's got I got woodwork by about two points you know and um, the rest were just fails and I thought that's it been at school since I was five now I'm 15 or 16 and it's come to absolutely nothing now that wasn't so much the crunch the crunch was that my father didn't care he just expected me to fail and there was a lie. See, it, see, so it's true. There was no fruit for me being at high school. 
But what's not true was the lie that I received that I will never, ever be successful. I will never, ever have fruit. That's what I believed in my heart. And that's what I had to root out. And so God was just saying, work with me. Hand it over. I said to Joy about it this morning. I know where I, I'm glad I told Joy because I just, I just ended up in tears telling Joy about it. I was like, oh, that's raw. It's still here. But the Holy, the Holy Spirit is good. And there is miracles going inside, on inside of every single one of us. If we just tune in and listen, he's at work. He's at work because he wants us to be. He wants us to be whole. The gospel is good news for the poor. Poor in spirit. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter. It's good news. It's not just good news for the for the for the um, poor, it's also good news for the oppressed. It's good news for the broken. It's good news for those wandering around trying to find God. God is good news. You know, um, another thing I found, and I've never heard this um, before, and I heard it in Kerry College. I'm very grateful for Kerry College. And, um, and so uh, one of the things was that, that the word that Mark used for gospel, um, it's a Ro- actually a Roman word, and it's eu- euangelion, and it's where we get gospel from. Good news. Um, but it means... Um, the uh, an imperial announcement of victory. Victory, victory, victory. And Jesus is keen to keep deception out of his church. I'm just going to pray. Father, I want to thank you. You're an awesome God. You're a beautiful God. I'm not sure what you're going to do with this morning, but I know you're moving in people's hearts. A lot of, sorry if that was a bit jumbled. But Father, right now I pray, Holy Spirit, move amongst us. Let us go home dreaming, Lord, that you're a good, we know you're a good God, but Lord, what do you want to do? How is it, Father, that you want to um, pour out your kingdom over each and every one of us? Lord, let us just pray and rejoice in one voice. Let us thank you, Lord, for what you've done and are doing amongst us. Thank you, Lord, that you... I believe there, there is a, um, the words that have been spoken from Isaiah 43, I think it is, and it's um, doing a new thing in the desert, you know, spring, spring up in the desert. I, somebody help me. Do you know this, the verse? And then it, but, it's, it's, um, but it finishes like, behold, do you perceive it? And there's been so many times it's been, and, and uh, yeah, I perceive you're doing a new thing, um, but I didn't know what it was but I thought I'd know it when I saw it. And Lord, I believe it's the, the healings that are coming, the ones who are being set free. Wendy's being set free is a sign. It's not that others haven't been set free, but there's a new move where it's happening quickly, and Lord, and thoroughly. And look, it's, it's like there doesn't have to be a revisit. As Mark's healing of shingles, a thing that can plague people. Lord, th- I'm completely healed. Joys um, that that desolation is off of this church, Lord. It's coming off. It's moved, and I believe that's the part of the new thing that we're to perceive. That there's a new time of prosperity for us all, and prosperity comes in many shapes and forms. So I pray, Lord, prosper your bride in Jesus' mighty name. We love you, and we thank you, and we honor you, and we lift up the name of Jesus in this place. Amen. I won't ask for the team to come because uh, Ignite will be keen to release the children. Um, God bless you. Have an awesome Sunday afternoon. Have a great cup of tea together. If you'd like prayer, we'd love to pray for you. Mark, who are all different ones, um, bless you heaps. Take care.